everyone. Thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Mick Eisenberg, and today I'm here to present to you guys a tool I wrote that is an extension of the Burp Suite uh, toolkit called Auth Matrix. And uh, hopefully you guys will find it interesting and uh, make your guys' lives a little easier testing uh, authorization and web applications and web services. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a security engineer at Security Innovation. Uh, I've been in the industry for about four years now and I've mainly been uh, services and client work, um, pretty much the whole spectrum of, of the security sphere, all the way from web, mobile, desktop, down to the low level uh, embedded stuff. Uh, as far as specializations and research in the past, I've uh, worked on fuzzing, cryptocurrencies. I'm not gonna talk about that in this presentation, but if that's something that interests you, uh, find me afterwards. Um, and in these four years, I've spent a lot of time pen testing web, uh, specifically for large tech companies. Um, and so in this time, I've come to a few uh, observations that I wanted to share with you guys really quickly. Um, one thing I've noticed in this half de decade is that web security, for the most part, has gotten a lot better for new applications that are built on modern, uh, modern frameworks. Um, it's been seen that uh, by putting the effort into proper design in terms of security and research before building the application, uh, it prevents a lot of the issues that we're so accustomed to at this point. Um, I want to mention that you know, even though web security pen testing is a very you know complex field, for this presentation I, I want to focus it down to three major categories um, for what to do when testing. And uh, I, I see these categories as input validation, uh, configuration, and authorization and business logic. Um, I'll talk about those in a little bit, but I want to point out that uh, so far it looks like it's getting easier to do things the right way the first time. Um, if you look at some of these attacks that have been so common in the past, um, you look at the methodologies for testing and fixing, um, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, XSS has gotten pretty standardized on how to test for it, how to find it, how to locate it, um, and there's resources online that you know, allow you to uh, figure out what kind of inputs to send, how to evade filters, and for fixing, it's pretty much become the, the known uh, rule that out, uh, output encode everything, all data. And people are starting to do this by default, which is, which is good. That's not saying that these bugs don't exist. They sure do still exist. Um, but they are becoming more and more rare, which I see as a good sign. Uh, same thing with SQL injection. Um, same sort of process for testing, fuzzing all the inputs, evading the filters. And uh, once again, there's a known way that's the right way to fix it, which is to use parameterized queries by default. Um, CSRF authentication and uh, uh, open redirects, same kind of concept with testing now. Uh, testers know what to look for, and it's just sort of exploring the application until you find signs that these issues exist. And uh, as far as for fixing, this is not really left into the developer's hands to come up with their solution anymore. Um, really, the work is now picking the right framework that knows about these bugs and handles them by default. So what's the problem? Uh, the problem is that critical bugs are still very common in web applications and web services. Um, and the ones I'm gonna focus on today are the authorization bugs. Um, the reason authorization is uh, still so common is because it's still really hard to get right. Um, it's hard to develop for, it's hard to test, it takes a lot of time, and it's going to be specific to each unique application, which makes it hard to uh, choose you know, the right decisions up front that's generic. Um, I wanna quickly point out the difference between authentication and authorization. Some people might disagree with the exact specifics, but for the sake of this talk, we'll think of authentication as proving who you are to the application, to the server. Um, and this is done usually by a login, maybe a single sign-on. And at that point, uh, it's, it's all session management. So what kind of session tokens are used? How secure are those tokens? Where, where's the entropy coming in from? Um, that's all authentication. Uh, for authorization, um, it's more uh, once the server knows who we are, how do we prove that we are allowed to do what we are trying to do on the application? And the general way to do this is through permissions, through access controls, usually by assigning roles to users and uh, having specific actions that a role can, can perform. So the OWASP top 10, how many times have you guys seen this yet today? Um, I wanted to break down the OWASP top 10 in terms of uh, you know, what these attacks are, very briefly, don't worry, very briefly, and uh, what the common fixes and ways of, of, of testing for them are. Um, uh, the darker ones are just the new ones uh, added in the 2013, so ignore that uh, shading there. 
Um, but the first two, uh, five and nine, security misconfigurations and unknown vulnerability components. Uh, this has been, you know, the, 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 the area that has been most like uh, sort of covered by automation and scanning tools. And it's, you know, scanning tools do an all right job, whether they're external or uh, internal static analysis tools. Um, it's, it's generally seen that, you know, you can run these tools and it'll find your configuration areas. It will find the ne network issues. Um, and then fixing it is just, you know, releasing the patching schedule and fixing your configurations. The next category is what I like to consider the framework uh, bugs. And these are the ones that have, like I was mentioning earlier, have slowly started to be fixed by default when you choose the correct framework. Um, these include the injections, the authentications, that's a sign on, uh, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, and unvalidated redirects. And usually by making the right decisions on how to build your app up front, uh, these can be prevented for the most part by default, which is nice. Um, and the last category are the specialized ones, and these are the ones that I think deal with uh, authorization. Um, and uh, the issue here with these ones is the framework really can't be aware of what kind of authorization plan you have. It's going to be specific to every single case. If, if you have an application that has users that are regular users, anonymous users, uh, admins, there are some you know, common ones that you'll see often, but really it's, it's, it's hard to generalize. You can't come up with a, a you know, one-stop solution that you do by default. Um, so it really requires thinking about it in a security context uh, up front. Um, Here's some authorization examples, uh, just so we are clear what we're talking about. Um, so the first one is uh, going to be the uh, OS top 10 number four, which is the direct object reference. I, I kind of grouped them all together, but just to separate them out, uh, you can see it's a website, and just reading the URL, you can sort of guess that it's going to return sensitive info regarding the user who has the ID 53. Um, accessing that ID 53 is the direct object that we are referencing in this case. Um, the other one, number seven, was the missing function level access controls. Uh, I like to call it forced browsing. That's a, a more common term for, for what it is. Um, and really that's, you know, in this case, the, the URL is to an admin page, and it uh, has some specific functionality that's assumed only to be uh, available to admins. And uh, the vulnerability comes in is if somebody who's not an admin is able to access that page, and it just assumes the user would not be able to see it because there's no link to it or something like that, um, and it still succeeds. Um, and as you can see by the last example, these can be uh, layered and uh, happen, you know, both the uh, uh, force browsing and direct object referenced. So just in case you're thinking, uh, well, these are all GET requests, so that, you know, if you're using POST requests like you're supposed to, this is not an issue. No, still the uh, exact same scenario. In this case, it's the same one from before, the delete user that's admin, and it provides the uh, ID 53 as a POST request. But uh, any user who has a different privilege level uh, can still attempt to make that request, and if it succeeds, that's still a, a hugely critical authorization issue. <laughs> so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the the challenges with authorization. Like I said before, it's hard to, harder to fix in a generic case with the framework. Um, another issue is that it is time consuming to test. Um, you know, as a tester, when I've tried to uh, you know eliminate all chances of authorization and make sure I cover every single case and test each one. Um, it's often a very long manual process um, that takes a, requires a lot of uh, note taking and keeping my own state. Um, and it's hard to be verified that I did it correctly because of that, because you know, each tester sort of works in their own way. Um, if you're you know, working on one project for a long time, maybe you're, you're in, you know, working on an internal product for your company, uh, usually the situation there is to, to try to automate this so that you can come up with an automated solution that you can test over and over. But that being the case, it usually requires programming from scratch and can take time and is not very generic and can't be reused. Um, and like I said there, the, the, it becomes harder to retest. So if you know, you're, you're testing the application for the second time after there's been changes that uh, fix the, the issues, you may have to do the entire process over again. So for me, when I'm testing authorization, this is usually, unfortunately, what the process looks like. Uh, it's a manual process. Um, the first thing I do is I enumerate all the roles of the system. And this can be uh, interesting sometimes because it can be kind of confusing what a role of the system is. Um, oftentimes, you know, you'll talk to a client and they say, well, we have a user and an admin. But that's not really the full story, you know, because there's also the anonymous user who's expected not to be able to do anything. 
um, maybe the admin has the ability to give permissions specifically to certain users, where the user has like read permissions or write permissions. In that case, each user with a different combination of those permissions is essentially a new role. Right? So enumerating all the roles, the next step is the, the classic pen testing, explore the application, use the functionality, how it's intended to be used, so you have a full map of everything that you know, is in scope. Um, and after that, you uh, create users for each one of those roles and authenticate them and get the tokens required to, to perform requests. And after that is this, this horrible uh, manual for loop that is so prone to error, where if you look at it as a for loop, we uh, generate every single combination of role user request that is needed to, to confirm that there's no issues. And we run the request, we see the result, we look at the results and determine, did this work? Is this user in any roles where this should work? If not, you know that's an issue. And we record our results and usually it turns into a big notepad checklist, at least for me, and it gets uh, pretty messy. And in that for loop is so much opportunity for a tester to have human error. I mean, you know, we all like to think that we are, you know, disciplined enough to be able to test this and, and make no mistakes, but uh, having such a long manual process just by default uh, opens it up to human error. So this picture right here is a, a picture of a threat model sort of uh, access matrix that uh, kind of common. Um, even if, if a tester doesn't have it in their routine to, to generally you know, build a threat model, this is something that we kind of build in our brains implicitly. Um, I want to describe what we're looking at a little bit. Um, what we see here is on uh, the left side are our assets, our protected information of the system. Um, in this case, it's going to be employee information like their name, social security number. Um, on the right hand side, we have all of the roles. So you can see there's the role for anonymous user, an employee, a manager, an admin. And then we have what we call the, the CRUD model, uh, which is create, read, update, and delete. And these are the actions that we can perform on these assets. And so the, generally we build either you know, on paper or on, on, uh, in a document or just in our brain an idea of which users, which roles are allowed to perform these actions. We sort of build this table. Um, and if you look, just to sort of interpret it a little bit, you can see if you go to the employee, an employee name, you can see that you know, they should never be able to delete an employee name, makes sense, and they should sometimes be able to like, read or update it. right? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by sometimes is, in this case, the employee would have access to their own employee information, not any other employee in the, in the system. However, if you look over, it has the manager, which in this case is an always, so they always have the ability to see a name or update the name, makes sense. And so what I was wanting to do is, you know, we have this awful process of manual testing for authorization, and we have this, this beautiful table that we sort of build, like, implicitly. If we could combine these two and sort of make the process more easier and eliminate the need for, for human, or the, the possibilities of human error, um, that would be great. And so that's where uh, the idea for auth matrix came in. So auth matrix. Uh, here's a list of some of the design goals that I had uh, going into the project. Um, the big one being an intuitive UI. Um, you know, if it's confusing and doesn't really help in the, the, the testing flow and it, you know, it becomes a task that's not really worth doing, it's not going to get used. So I wanted to make sure that this is uh, you know, easy enough to look at and, uh, and work with so that it is, you know, it's something that assists and doesn't hurt uh, the process of testing. Um, it's because it's hard to automate for the creation of roles and creation of users because they're all going to be different in each system. I figured the solution was to move all of that work up front just in the same way that we build a threat model in the beginning of the project once we've explored. Um, and so we'd have this mapping of the, the conditions of our tables of users and roles and, and requests all up front. And once that's been done and you can look and verify and check your work, then I want just a simple click and run interface. Right? Um, by doing this, I was hoping that it would reduce the chance of human errors by sort of like, you know, pulling out that for loop that we saw earlier. And uh, I want to make sure that this application covered at least 90% of the test scenarios because if this is really cool but it can only be used for a couple target applications, it's, it's not really worth it. Um, I wanted to add in reproducible testing. So that way, uh, once it's been tested once and you have a solution, maybe you can test it again to confirm. Maybe after it's been patched and uh, updated and fixed, you can just run it simply again without having to do the work again and uh, have your, your new results. And yeah, big thing, make life easier. If it's uh, difficult to use, if it's complicated, it's not going to get used. There's no point to it. So uh, 
the platform that I decided to use to build this application, I chose a Burp Suite. The biggest reason is it's widely used. I use it for practically every single web application and web service uh, engagement that I'm ever on. Um, it has a lot of power, has a lot of functionality, and it's very, very simple to use and uh, get used to. Um, basically, you set it up as an attack proxy, um, you know, requests go from the browser through Burp, and you can view every single HTTP request in full as it goes through. And from there, you can make modifications, you can fuzz, you can tamper with it, you can you know, take a request and uh, you know, uh, send it directly from Burp and avoid the, the process of using a browser altogether. It's just really nice, so I wanted to uh, build it from there. And luckily, Burp Suite has uh, this extender API that it added a few years ago. And this allows you to basically customize Burp and add new features to it by using their APIs. Really, really nice. Um, they have the APIs in multiple languages, which is great. Uh, Burp is written in Java, but they also support Python and Ruby. And I'm a Python guy, so I thought that's perfect. I'll just use Python. Um, but some of the features that you can do with the, the Burp Suite extender APIs are uh, creating new tabs within Burp. Uh, you can send requests uh, just you know manually constructed from the HTTP level, just turn it into a, a request. Uh, you can modify every single request going through Burp. So if you want to make a modification to every header that goes through Burp, uh, you can do that. Uh, you can uh, format data types to make it easier for you to read and, and work well with. That includes like JSON, or if there's JavaScript and you want to make it pretty, you can do that. Um, and you can update the, the Burp in-house <coughs> scanner uh, to search for the specialized vulnerabilities that you're looking for. So if you're working with a framework which has a specific type of vulnerability, it can be extended inside Burp to, uh, to catch those. Um, here's a list of some extensions that have been written by Burp, uh, for Burp in the past. Um, this one, the top one, is one that I have used on projects all the time, and that's uh, writing a Burp extension for uh, API signatures. So if you're using a web service and they have uh, you know, private key per user and they sign the message and then put that signature inside the header, um, this can all be done with Burp so that it happens you know, on the fly and you don't have to worry about it and you can just tamper with data and know that the signature is going to be correct. It makes testing really easy. Um, but some other uh, extensions that people have made in the past are you know, scanning for Heartbleed, uh, integrating with other tools such as like Nmap, uh, pulling up you know, the list of targets from Nmap, and just general logging and note-taking that helps you know, accelerate your methodology. Um, Burp, also, Burp also includes uh, the Burp App Store, Bap Store, which makes it really nice. So rather than having to search all of GitHub and all of the internet to find all these cool extensions that you want to use, um, right with inside the application, there's a store which offers free extensions. And it just makes it simple, so you can click install and then just start using it. Um, so when I searched through there, I found a couple off extensions, and I want to make sure that the, the work I was doing was, you know, not something that already exists, and uh, it, you know, it was uh, something new and helpful. Does, does it work with both the free version and the pro version? I don't know if the Burp App Store does, but Off Matrix does work with the free version. So, um, but I, I, I did find several off extensions, and after you know reviewing and trying them out, uh, it didn't fit the needs that I was looking for. It didn't fit those criteria. Um, the big thing is it still kind of came down to the one request at a time. You would just have a way of switching the cookies, and then it'd still be a manual process of comparing it and then determining, does this user somebody who should have this response and this request? Um, and more so, often the, the UI was just confusing, and it just it doesn't make sense to, to spend the time you know, getting used to this application or the extension when it may not be helpful. A lot of people just default back to their manual processes. All right. So now we're going to start the dreaded live demo. Are you guys ready for this? Hopefully this goes uh, as smoothly as I want. So for the live demo, uh, we have a sample application that is uh, going to be our target. And we're going to set up off matrix to have a configuration that, that you know, tests the off cases of this application. And uh, the target that we chose is actually um, the hackathon that my company, Security Innovation, uh, builds. And uh, it's super, super nice. It's a, it's a web-based hackathon that integrates with a scoring system so that you find a bug, you find cross-site scripting, and there's a nice little pop-up that comes up and you know indicates. And uh, it has a scoreboard that you can uh, look at and then uh, you know rate yourself compared to other users. And uh, the one that we're going to use today is our sample HR website. Um, so we'll explore this really quickly. And uh, oh, before I do this, though, actually, 
Let me see if I can. Let's change the uh, screen to duplicate. Anybody know the hotkey in Mac to change screen? Um, it's just this way. Yeah. <coughs> no, mirror, mirror display. Mirror display. Yeah. There's a, so uh, I think it's under phone uh, arrangements. Ah, there we go. Boom. Got it. Woo. All right. Live demo going okay so far. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so before we do that, uh, I want to show you guys. It also has a section where you can see the completed challenges. Um, so if we go there, and the internet stays okay. There we go. We can see uh, a list of all the challenges that I've completed so far. Um, so I just want to point out, there's only one done so far. Um, but I'll show you what it looks like when you actually solve a challenge here. So one common one is uh, going to be SQL injection on the login screen. I'm going to give these away. We're also running this hackathon right now as we speak. Uh, if you go to the security innovation booth, you can get a username and uh, mess around with it you know, on your own time for the next uh, two days. So if you're interested in doing that, here's some answers right here. But I'm going to do just the classic SQL injection here to, to log in. Do the same for password. And uh, Rampage. yeah, 200 <laughs> points. Cool. But let's uh, let's quickly just like explore the application and see what we're dealing with because that's you know I'm going to skim through it because it's a large application. Um, but that would be the first step here is is you know see your target and enumerate every single functionality and endpoint. So in here, we have timesheets. We have payment information. It might be best if I start to tab in. Uh, we have pay stubs, preferences, profile information, all things that are normal for an employee. And then we have these other two tabs here, um, management, which is for the specific manager role. And in there, you can look at employees, approve timesheets, approve time off, reviews, and generate various reports as well. Um, and then another section that is specifically for uh, admin, or HR as they call them, um, is to create employees, to view all employees and other reporting features. Um, looks like Hannah Cook, the, uh, the user that we logged into with the SQL injection, is all three of those roles. She's an admin, uh, manager, and a regular employee. Um, let's log in to some test accounts that I made recently just to see what it looks like if you don't have those roles. Super secret password, it's password. Um, in this case, there's no functionality to access those admin and management uh, abilities. So we can assume that those are specific for those role types and, and shouldn't be uh, accessible from an employee without those permissions. Um, but it's the same kind of features here. All right, so auth matrix. What is our first step? First step is go to the tab here with Auth Matrix. Can everybody see all right? Is it going to be large enough? OK, let me know if it's too small and I, I learned the nifty uh, zoom in feature, just in case. So um, well, let's define the roles. So in each system, there's usually going to be an anonymous, even if it has no permissions. Uh, so we're going to define anonymous. And we see it uh, comes up right here. And we have three other types of roles. We have employee. We have. Uh, what is it? Manager. And we have our HR or admin. Uh, let's see if we can make this. There we go. It's a little better. All right. And uh, now we assign the rules, and we want to make sure that we have a good combination of users so that each kind of case that we care about is going to be uh, here and testable. Um, so when we create users, once again, we want the anonymous user. Uh, we're going to have just one regular employee, the one I just logged in. Uh, we're going to have someone who is just a manager. And we're going to have someone who is just admin. All right. So here's our matrix right now. And the first step is to define which roles do these users exist in. So anonymous is just going to be an anonymous. Just check that here. Um, employee is just going to be an employee. Manager is going to be a manager, but also an employee. And HR is going to be HR 
and also in play because every authenticated user is going to be in play, right? And this I learned just by exploring the application. Um, the next step is to find the requests, find the actions that are being performed and add them. So easy way to do that is to go to, uh, oh, one second. Here's a second hiccup. I uh, did not have my proxy on when I was exploring the first time, so it didn't record all the requests that I was making. So we're going to do that really quickly again in speed mode. Come on, internet. Oh, proxy, duh. <laughs> all right, we're going to do the one equals one again just to have someone who has all of uh, the access. I'm just going to quickly step through and make each one of these requests. This way we have the baseline of uh, what actions we have. Boom, 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 boom. Almost done. Cool. From here, we can take away uh, the browser. Um, so let's go to the target page. And now we have our target. Cool. And from here, we can see that we have all these requests that we just made. Uh, here's the get request to reviews. And we can see the response. And uh, I'm just going to grab all a bunch of them all at once. Um, I'm just going to grab all of these get requests. And uh, we'll start with just one for now, and I'll, I'll add the rest later. But it's easy. You uh, right-click it. You say send to auth matrix. Now when you go to auth matrix, you have this request right here. Um, if your URL is unmanageable, you can modify it to change it to whatever it might be. So it can just be review or like employee reviews. But in this case, I'm going to keep it as the request just because the URLs are, are easy enough to follow in this application. Um, the next thing we see here is the success regex. So this is the condition that uh, AuthMatrix is going to look for to determine whether the, uh, the request succeeded in the action or failed. Um, the default we have here is just looking for a 200 OK. In this application, that works perfect because it responds with a 200 whenever it succeeds and a 300, uh, 303 you know, unauthorized user when it fails. So we're just going to leave it like this. Um, but otherwise, you would just add in you know, whatever you're looking for from the response to indicate that it succeeded or failed. Um, so let's uh, quickly check this and say which users are allowed to see this. Anonymous user would not be allowed because they are not authenticated. And employees are allowed. Uh, from there, you can simply just right click it and requ uh, run requests. Or you can press the button at the bottom that just says run. And we see. Get results. Oh, I missed a very important step. So why did this not work? It's because I haven't added any session tokens to these users yet. So this is the next step. So now we have all of our users defined. We want to authenticate each user. And the easiest way here is to find where I logged in before, grab this specific request, send it to the repeater, and then uh, modify this. So I'm going to do test employee one. Password is password. And you can see it says redirect to home, set this session ID. So here's your cookie. You just grab this, and this is for employee one. And then just add it right here into the session token area. If you want to expand that, just see it. Cool. Um, so let's do that for the rest of the users really quick. Uh, the next one is test manager. Read. And one more is test HR. Done. And the last one are anonymous. We just you know give it the cookie, but take away the value, so it's an empty cookie. All right. Now let's try running it one more time. Everything's configured correctly. Press run. Boom, and it all succeeded. To verify it succeeded, we just click the request. We see our original here. Um, we can see the session ID that it was you know, originally with. Uh, the response was a 200. Um, we can go to anonymous user and see that the session ID has been cleared. And look at the response. It has a 303 telling you to log in. And then each other user has a 200 OK and uh, was requested with their session tokens uh, specifically. Um, 
If you're going to make post requests on a, to an application that has CSRF, you can also enter in the CSRF token right here. Um, so far, it's only supporting static tokens. So if the CSRF token is having the same lifetime as a session token, which is pretty common in most applications, even though it's not the most secure, uh, you can just enter that in right here. All right, so now we got the first one done. Let's go ahead and just add a bunch more. So let's add these two to off matrix. Uh, let's go into our admin here and add all of these guys. These are all just the requests that I made, uh, simple get requests to areas of the page that should only be accessed by those users. And let's add some, uh, some manager specific ones. Sweet. So now we have all our requests here and let's just go through. Uh, anonymous shouldn't make any requests to any of these. Uh, all employees should be able to access these two. Uh, these ones are specific to admin, which is equivalent to HR. So we go through and check all of those. And we have manager here for the rest of them. Awesome. And now we just run it. And let's see what we find. Boom. So the red indicates that there was an issue. Um, it could be something configuration, so we'll double check it and make sure you know it, it, it's possible that I, I mistyped something and it's a false positive. But if it's not, that's basically an indication of an authorization bypass bug, and uh, in some cases can be very critical. Uh, so let's verify this one. This one was to admin user list. Um, anonymous user had a 303. That's expected. Uh, HR, which is the only one who should be allowed to see this page. I'll render it just so you see like what kind of information you're getting from this request. You're getting a list of every single user in the system. Um, so HR succeeded, and it's showing red on employee and manager. And as you can see, those ones succeeded as well, even though those users with those session tokens did not have the proper permissions to access this page. Um, it still was able to uh, you know, produce the results, and, and uh, this vulnerability was caught. Um, same thing with, uh, with uh, these ones as well. Um, as you can see, there was no access controls on these requests, and so all of them succeeded, and uh, off matrix caught that. Uh, if you look at this one, this is where an admin user, um, it did not succeed. It looks like the, the, the authorization was successful. And if we double check this by saying, you know, did employee one catch it, it says, boom, authorization error. So this is where the application acted as it was supposed to. Um, all right, let's stick back to the slides really quick. So the default, the default one is, um, but uh, as you can see in uh, right here, we have these success regex, and that pretty much allows you to say like, look for anything that I'm looking for specifically in the request. So it might be, you know, in a case where it will show you uh, um, like the, the the username or just just like a page, you can type in a regex that will catch it. Okay, anywhere in the response. Anywhere in the response. Right. Yep, exactly. All right. So now. Uh, Let's uh, take that and revise our methodology that had that awful manual for loop with so much room for uh, human error. And let's take a look at how we do it now. Uh, still starts out the same. We explore the tar target application. Uh, we add all the functionality endpoints to off matrix. We go through in that target list and you know, after enumerating the entire page, add each one. Um, we define all the roles and users of the system that we need, fill out those, those tables. Um, and then we define the success conditions to determine so that the, the, the tool can automatically figure out whether um, you know, it succeeded or it did not. Um, after that, we just generate the session tokens one time, plug them all in, run, and then save and repeat. Way easier, way nicer. Um, here's a couple of uh, tips and tricks. Um, the majority of cases you're going to find if you're testing a web application will be where uh, cookies are the tokens being used. Um, off matrix supports both headers and cookies if they put the token in the HTTP headers. Um, easy way it does that is it looks for what you enter in and if it's equals, it knows it's a cookie. Uh, if it's a colon like it's seen in HTTP headers, it pops it right into the HTTP headers. Um, so one thing I didn't show you on the last demo, but I'm gonna show you in the next one is the ability to save and load these configs. There was a save and load button near the very bottom. Um, and this allows you to, once you fill out these tables and define these roles, uh, you can just save it and serialize it to disk and then load it up at a separate time 
and add a new session tokens and run it again makes it much easier. Um, the issue here is you're serializing data to disk and then unserializing that data into the application, which if anybody follows serialization bugs is, is prone to security flaws all the time. So my recommendation, I give you a little warning message when you try to do it, is don't load any trusted configs, untrusted configs. Uh, make sure this is a config that you saved yourself or it came from a verified source uh, just to prevent any kind of risk whatsoever. And I'm a security guy, I get paranoid about these things, so I leave a big, uh, big warning message there. And uh, the other thing is uh, parameters can matter in authorization as well. So if we uh, talk about that uh, part of the OS POP10, the insecure direct object reference, where in the example it was using the user ID and making action on that, um, this can also be handled pretty well with auth matrix. And I'm gonna demonstrate that really short, quickly here. All right, is it still, yes, sweet. Um, oh, one other thing I wanna check really quick. Uh, so it has these four uh, results here that have issues. Let's go look at our scoreboard really quick and see how that compares. Boom, okay, so it has a SQL injection from the first one and it has one, two, three, four results. So by using auth matrix like this, even though we didn't get the pop up with the oh yeah or whatever noise, um, we still got the points for it and uh, it registered as the series volumes. Um, but in this case, okay. So we were talking about direct object reference. So, so if we go to a functionality like the paste stub section here, you can see that this paste stub is, uh, has a get parameter here, the user ID with a user one. Um, and in this case, um, it's for that Hannah Cook, the one we were able to log into with SQL injection. So let's just add a new user really quick. Um, we're gonna add a new user, make it Hannah Cook. Um, we can just go to our repeater and grab the last request because that's who Hannah Cook is authorized, uh, authenticated as. Just grab this one just in case. Grab that token. Plug that in here. Um, and Hannah Cook, as you can see by looking at the web interface, has all the privileges. Uh, she's both a manager and HR. We'll just check all of the boxes here. Um, but what we can do here is we can also add a new role. Um, during uh, client assessments, usually they'll you know, give us a list of roles and we'll say we, we need test accounts for at least two of each of those roles. And this allows us to do cross user testing, right? So in order to sort of replicate that in Auth Matrix, all you need to do is say uh, user ID one. And now you have a new role. And the only user who can be user ID one is this Hannah Cook. And I'll show you how I'll use that in a second. None of this changes because this still is all dependent on whether you're employee, manager, or HR. Um, but if I go to that request pay stubs and I grab this one that was only gonna return for Hannah Cook, that user one, and I send to off matrix. Now I can select only user ID one should succeed there. It's gonna only choose Hannah Cook as the one successful option. And I can just run this request. And as you can see, all users were able to see the pay stubs of Hannah Cook. So this is once again, an issue. And uh, just to double check here, do we get points for it? Yes, list another user's pay stubs via query tam tampering. Awesome. All right, um, to, to help with this, because sometimes looking at the URL, if it's uh, you know, not included in the get parameters or post parameters, it may get kind of tricky if you want to have multiple users trying to get pay stubs. Uh, so I can just rewrite this as pay stubs for user one. Makes it a little bit easier. So now, assuming that I've gone through the entire application and mapped everything, I can then go to the process of saving. I'll just save this as demo.state and then clear it, and if I ever, you know, say they fix the problems and we want to do some regression testing, all I have to do is load up the old state. It warns me, are you sure you want to load this? Is deserializing data is scary? Yes, we do, because we just created it, fine. And then you can see it's all back up. Um, the results don't show. Uh, that's just an issue with uh, using the Burp API, but everything else is saved, and you can just, uh, once again, run it, run as many as you want to run. and uh, just reconfirm the same results as last time. Awesome. Whew, live demo. <laughs> 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 
All right, back to the slides. Here's a picture uh, basically demonstrating exactly what we just did. Um, so here's some current limitations on using off matrix. Uh, like I said before, right now, uh, it only supports static CSRF tokens. If you have, you know, if you're doing your application right and you have CSRF tokens that expire on every single request, uh, off matrix is not currently gonna be able to handle that. Um, but that is the rare case, unfortunately. And so it still fits within my 90% of uh, targets threshold. Um, there's currently no support for multiple session tokens. If you have more than one cookie that identifies a user, uh, that won't work at this point as well. Um, and it's a bummer that right now session, uh, success detection has to be a regex. Um, other areas of Burp have a much more clean interface where you can look into the, the uh, response and sort of grab the section that you want and it'll handle all the regexing all automatically. Um, that might come in the future. Right now, it'll, you'll have to learn a little bit about regexing, but it's not too tough. Um, there's no support for web uh, service signature support, but like I said before, how you know there are other extensions that you can either build yourself or use to uh, create the signatures and put them in the headers automatically. Um, if done correctly, these two apps can integrate very, very well. A uh, common way I've done is by having uh, the, the signature extension look for a header like user one, admin one, and it just grabs that header and replaces it with the signature. And if that's the case, you can do the exact same thing uh, with, uh, with off matrix and just enter in that user one, and it should work as well. Um, one more thing it doesn't currently cover is uh, permission exceptions. What I mean by that is the rare case where an application says something like, here's an action, admins can do that action, managers can do that action, but if a user is both an admin and a manager, it shouldn't succeed. Um, this is definitely the rare, rare situation for, for role-based modeling, uh, access control modeling, but uh, because of that, I, I left it out and it would be too, too confusing to, to get into this first edition of Off Matrix. All right, so what is next? Uh, open sourced. It's going to be free, it's going to be open source, it's going to be available uh, on our Security Innovation GitHub page. Um, that will be available in the next next week, I think, some, sometime in this next week. Um, as far as for the next edition of Off Matrix, uh, Burp has this thing that uh, is pretty not well known within Burp, where it can use macros and just custom little, uh, little directives to renew session tokens automatically and to like renew CSRF tokens. Um, and it does provide an API to access this functionality, so that, that'll be something I'm exploring. And the last uh, slides are out of date because uh, I said I was gonna submit it to the Burp App Store for free download, but I found out today that it was approved and it is currently on the Burp App Store for free download, so uh, check it out. That's it, questions? Yes? Um, so it was a really manual process to build your template, mm -hmm. to go through and you know, click every page and every link. Mm -hmm. Burp, Burp does have a spider. Uh, I generally avoid using it because my experience is, you know, when you're using a spider, it might perform actions that you aren't aware of. Um, such if, it, let's say there's a, an issue where a delete user is unauthenticated and it's a get request and the Burp spider just goes and does that automatically and all of a sudden you have no users in the system and you can't really explain why that happened. So I, I generally think of it as a manual process and it's just, just the methodology that I tend to use. But if you want to risk using spider, it, it will fill out the target page in the same way. Um, but really, it's, it's important to, to note that you know, when testing authorization, it's important that the user has an understanding of, here's my request, this should succeed and this shouldn't succeed. And what Authmatrix allows is you to do all that work up front, check your work, and then let the testing and recording and confirming results be done by the application. So, yes? Sure. Um, other than saving and reloading the configs, uh, there's currently nothing inside off matrix for, for documentation. Um, that has been a feature that somebody has mentioned to me before that they'd like, maybe having commenting uh, attached to some of the requests. Um, I'll look into it. Um, other than that, you know, it's, it's still kind of a, a take your own notes. Um, it's just less about here. The notes are, are recording all my results that are so important. So. Um, 
I would I would make the claim that the table themselves are kind of the the proof, like sort of sort of using the 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 source as the docs. Um, that that doesn't mean that you know if if somebody wants to include their own you know more the easier to read more explanation report um, that that's definitely something that can be you know uh, highly encouraged. But right now there's no support for that within the app. The app just sort of allows the functionality of of making those tests. But, yeah. Yes. Sure. I, I definitely wrote this with testers in mind, but I think that's a great idea, and uh, it's definitely something to keep in mind. And if you have any great ideas about it, it's going to be open source, and I'd love to hear any any opinions. So. Right yes. <laughs> yep. All right. I think we're just about out of time. So uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.